It's good to have all of our regular attenders and our visitors and all the people that are here. Uh, This is going to be a spectacular day. Why? Because we're worshiping God. And we're giving God praise. And our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, all the glory for the great things he has done. And today we celebrate together as a church what God has done in the life of Dr. J. M. Ezell. Today is a special day for our beloved congregation as we gather together to praise God and to give him glory and to receive his blessed word. We honor today the service of this man who has committed his life to Christ and his church for nearly six decades. J.M. Ezell has been and is still today a passionate preacher of the gospel. He will preach for us this morning. He has pastored thousands of people and led hundreds to faith in Christ. Dr. Ezell has served Bethel Baptist Church for nearly 15 years. As pastor, he led the church to build this beautiful sanctuary that we enjoy today. And he led and ignited this church with a spirit of evangelism to have Cleveland County's well-known largest bus ministry. Dr. Ezell loved people, has always loved people, and he preached to them the Word of God as a well-seasoned pulpiteer. His cleverness and keen sense of humor has proved to be one of his greatest gifts. And Dr. Ezell has always dressed in beautiful, bold, bright colors (laughs) to express his joyful personality. He is a joyful personality, and we love him this morning. His pastoral care has been second to none. Second to none. And at the age of 84, Preacher Shelley is still a source of strength and stability to this church, the community, and our families. He has been a man given to hospitality. He's invited hundreds of people into his home over the years. I guess Dr. Ezell has served more tacos to more Baptists than any other preacher in America. He is to many a beloved friend, brother, pastor, and preacher. He was the beloved husband of his sweet Olita, who is at home with Jesus this morning. He's now Got a great and wonderful help me and lovely wife, Miss Mildred. He is daddy to Benita, Jimmy, Timothy, and Paul, stepfather to Pam and Angie, and grandfather to their children. Dr. Ezell, today we thank and we praise God for you. And we love you and we honor you today as a man of God. Come and lead us in prayer. I love you, man. This is the first time I've ever been speechless. <laughs> so many memories down memory lane overwhelms us in a time like this. I stand before you redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. A lot of things I don't know and never will know in this world, but I'm glad I know Jesus. Father, thank you for this wonderful day you've given us. Thank you, Lord, for the blessed rain that made us want to just stand out and look up to heaven and sing the doxology for every drop that was fallen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for keeping us. Thank you for this time together. Thank you, Father, for the power of God unto salvation to those who believe in these who have come because they're believers. They believe in Jesus. 
Thank you for their love for thee. And I pray you bless us, Lord, in this service today. And it'll bring honor and glory to the Lord Jesus, the only one who deserves honor, the only one who deserves recognition, who has done so much for the world. There may be another Washington. There may be another Abraham Lincoln. There may be other great leaders that come on the scene, but none will excel the blessed Son of God who made all these things possible. Thank you for this church. Thank you for the storms you've brought her through. And she's more than a conqueror. She's still holding forth the word of life. Thank you for the many who have walked on their knees that God has used to make all of this possible. Thank you for these who stand here today in this place to worship Christ, to acknowledge the worship of God. Thank you, Father, for friends and loved ones who challenge us and stir us and move us on to better things and greater things, greater than we could ever be without them. Thank you for this church and its leaders, for, for our deacons and their families, our teachers and workers. Thank you for the many open hands and hearts that reach out to minister to people that make Bethel what it is today as a ministering force for God. Thank you for our beloved choir and all of the musicians, for our music director, for his family. Thank you, Father, for the talent you've given this man to lead us, for our youth pastor. Thank you for him. Thank you for his dear wife. And thank you for our beloved pastor, a man of God that leads us, Father, and I pray your blessings upon him. God, thank you for the honor of standing here with these people, with these great leaders, with these dear friends and loved ones, thank you for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Dr. Ezel uh, has given in many ways to this church and to other churches across this land. The one thing I can say that I'm most thankful for that he's gave is he's been an old time preacher of the gospel. And as you're seated, you're going to view a message just for a moment, just a clip of a message that Dr. Ezel preached back in 1980. And the title of this sermon is The End of a Misspent Life. The End of a Misspent Life. Take the next uh, two to three minutes to view this with me. And she tried again and again to find where, strength, uh, where Samson's strength was. And he lied to her. She cried. There's nothing like the power of a woman's tears when she wants something. And this woman must have cried and said, Samson, you've deceived me. I've given you myself. I've been good to you. I've shown you, Samson, that I really love you. And so there we find them. Conspiring together, planning together to see him. And the first thing we know, Samson blurts out, my strength is in my hair. She called the barber, the barber cut his hair. And he went out to shake himself as before. And he found that he was like any normal man. And now, as a result, the Philistines are upon him. And they arrest him, they carry him down, they strip him, they beat him. They, they're cruel to him, they gouge out his eyes. And maybe with a pier, maybe with a sharp object, they gouge his eyeball out and pull it out of its socket. And it hangs upon his cheek. Here is this great monstrosity of a man that had prided himself in being strong and handsome and winsome in personality and let a little heart woman steal his power with God. One time I got on a, a huge commercial airline and I was sitting back in the first seat in the passenger's compartment and the door was open back in those days when there it was unheard of for hijackers. You didn't have to go through all kind of screening processes to get a board plane. We had some decent, honest people living in this world. 
who stood for something. We didn't have all of these anarchists and all of the terrorists that we see today, hear about today. And I sat there and after a while we were ready for takeoff and I saw the pilot and the co-pilot lay their hands upon this four throttles. Just little levers sticking up with a little black handle about that long on him. And I saw that pilot lay his hand upon those throttles. Then I saw the co-pilot lay his hand upon those throttles. And you see, it's a precautionary measure if the pilot should have a heart attack and taken off. The co-pilot would have his hands on the controls. And the plane could still go on and be airborne. Or it could come back and land. Protection. Precaution. And I saw them slowly push those four levers forward. And that momentum began to build. And it pressed me back against the back of my seat. And the plane vibrated a little bit. And pretty soon it took off into the wild blue yonders. And there was no turning, at a certain point on that runway, there was no turning back. It had to either become airborne or crash. There's a point in your life of no return. There's a point, my dear friend, beyond which, my friend, God will deal with you in justice. There is a time, I know not when, a place I know not where, that marks the destiny of men to heaven or despair. There is a line by us unseen which crosses every path, the hidden boundary between God's patience and His wrath. To cross that limit is to die, to die as if by still it may not pale the being of the eye, nor quench the glowing health. He feels, he says, that all is well as every fear is calm. He lives, he dies, he wakes in hell, not only doomed but damned. Oh, where is that mysterious born by which each path is crossed beyond which God himself had sworn that he who goes is lost? How long will men go on in sin? How long will God forbear? Where does hope end and where begin the confines of despair? One answer from the sky is given. Ye who from God depart while it is called today repent. And harden not your heart. If I could think of something dignified to say, (laughs) I'd say it right here. (laughs) Right here, I'd say it. Thank you. Thank you, Keith and the choir and the musicians, uh, these singers. uh, I've always marveled at how God uses people. I've always marveled at how he can take a song Uh, like we've had this morning with voices blending together and make such beautiful sounds. Uh, Thank you, Brother Keith, for putting all this music together for the choir, for these singers. God bless you. We go through this every Sunday. I don't know why all of you don't join that are not a member here. I mean, just come on, be a part of this crazy bunch. We love the Lord and we have a great time and I thank the Lord for his blessings upon us. Through the years, I stepped over and spoke to the pastor a moment ago and I said, uh, there are a lot more people here than there were the first Sunday you came on the scene. And this is kind of like it was Dr. Sims some years ago. Uh, when we remembered better days and God blessed us and, and you came on the scene and then you sent brother, uh, I believe his name is Keith, <laughs> Keith Cantrell. He came on the scene and just did a marvelous job under my scrutiny and direction. <laughs> and he has blessed us and then sent this a fellow by the name of Stephen Brackeen. That rhymes with green bean. (laughs) (laughs) 
Sit down, Junior. <laughs> he makes me feel young. Uh, he makes me want to be young. And uh, this, uh, this is a great day. Uh, if you want to know uh, something that's little, you, if you want to know how to get out of a shower rain, come and see me. I can tell you how to get out of a shower rain. If you want to know how to make it rain, come and see Pastor Tim. <laughs> he, he can make it rain. We had a prayer meeting the other day for rain. It had been dry. This has been the driest summer I think I've ever seen. And I've seen 84 of them slip by. And uh, we needed rain. And so we had all of the people from the county that wanted to come here and pray for rain. And they came and prayed. And this man who knows everything They remind, he reminds me of uh, Steve and Gilda Martin. <laughs> Steve and Gilda Martin said, we know everything. <laughs> Gilda said, what I don't know, Steve knows. <laughs> and what Steve doesn't know, I know. So what Pastor Sims doesn't know, Angie knows. And what Angela doesn't know, he knows. But now this man, this man had a prayer meeting and we came together and prayed and it rained. Praise God, we got rain. So I thank the Lord that he's here as our pastor and I enjoy working with him. <laughs> I hope I live to be older and I hope he lives to be as old as I am and I hope I live long enough to conduct his funeral. <laughs> hey, man. <laughs> Dr. Carl Bates told this when an evangelism conference in Texas. Dr. Bates was pastor of First Baptist Church in Charlotte for many years. I met him when he was at Beach Street Baptist Church in Texarkana, Texas, and he went from there to Amarillo, the First Baptist Church, and was there for a few years and then came to Charlotte. Great man, great heart. President of the convention for a couple of years. And he said he and his wife went to Switzerland to the Baptist World Alliance meeting. And he was on some office or in some office and he said he, it was a busy time going to conferences, seminars and so forth all through the conference of the Baptist World Alliance meeting. Switzerland. he said, uh, they kept talking about the theaters. They had some wonderful floor shows, family shows where the, you could take the family and go without all of this vulgarity, profanity and so forth so forth. And so the last evening, instead of going to the Baptist World Alliance, he went to that theater for a show. And he said he and his wife went in and sat down and said, it sure is good. Said all through the conference said there was a little squeaky voice and said every time somebody would sing or a preacher would preach, that little squeaky voice would sound out, amen. Amen. He said, I got so tired hearing that. Amen. He said, I said to my wife, let's go take in that floor show. And we went down, sat down in that floor, that theater. And he said, the curtains lifted, the, the lights dimmed, and the stage lights came on. And about a dozen beautiful little ladies dressed in ballerina costumes came out, whirled around like that, whirled around. Finally, they just whirled off to the side. He said, my wife and I sat there and punched one another. 
About that time from way up in the third balcony came that little squeaky voice, amen. (laughs) It almost broke up the meeting. But I see Curtis and Sue Stiles here today. Curtis and Sue are my children. Uh, Curtis surrendered to preach here and went on to become somebody and did a great work. You're now retired and, and you have a beautiful house and I still want to come up there and sleep out in that kind of a balcony like looking out across the mountain. I want to come up there and sleep in that sometime. Don't you all sell it and move because I want to come see it. And then Mildred's daughters are here. Uh, Johnny couldn't be here, but Angie and <laughs> Angie and Keith are here, Parkers. And, uh, and my, my son Timothy and his wife Angela and their son River is here. You've heard me talk about River, my grandson. And then Paul and his girls, Megan and Melanie are here. I wish Jimmy could have come down. He and his wife from Delaware, but they couldn't make it. Uh, And Benita, my daughter, is here. She lives in Augusta, Georgia. She's music director at the base chapel there in uh, Fort Gordon. Her husband couldn't come. He's having to keep the grandbaby. But they're here. How did you all sneak all of this up on me? Keith, did you have anything to do with that? We just did I don't know who did it. But whoever did it, I'll whip you when we're over this. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Sims. God bless you. Love you. Thank the Lord for you and your family. I thought about uh, the old Baptist preacher that was up talking about warming up for his sermon about the advantageous position of Baptist in the world to come over on the other side. And he stopped and he said, who is going to be first to heaven? He said, I'll tell you who's going to be first in heaven. It's going to be Baptist. And there was a Presbyterian woman sitting in the congregation insulted by that remark, and she got up, stood up, and said, I resent that. Said, I've always been taught that Presbyterians are going to be first ones in heaven. That Baptist preacher was kind of taken back, and he thought for a moment, and he said, well, ma'am, I guess you're right. The Bible said the dead in Christ shall rise first. A Catholic priest carried a new convert out for dinner. Brother uh, Monteith, you and, uh, what's your name? <laughs> You'll enjoy this. Uh, he, he, my, he's my Catholic friend. And uh, I don't know how they're doing it without you this morning. But uh, a Catholic priest carried this, uh, went out to this new convert's home for supper and the they were all sitting around the table and everything was going fine seemingly, but there was a little girl that kept looking at him. She didn't take her eyes off, just staring at him. He was very uncomfortable and after he finished eating, he said to the little girl, he said, I notice you watching me closely and he said, I know it's because of my collar. He said, I got my collar on backwards, haven't I? And he just reached up like that and pulled that collar out held it up before that little girl and said, what does it say on that collar? And the little girl looked at it and said, says, we'll kill fleas for six months. <laughs> A lady who belong, I don't know why this is turning to Presbyterians, but uh, uh, I love Presbyterians, but her dog died 
and she wanted her pastor to come and conduct the funeral and said, called and said, uh, pastor, would you come and conduct the funeral of my dog? I want to bury him. He said, I can't do that, man. Said, why don't you try the Baptist preacher? Said, he does things like that. She said, I will. She said, before I call the Baptist preacher, said, I want to ask you, how much should I give him? Three or four hundred dollars for bearing my dog. The preacher said, ho, ho, wait just a minute. I didn't know your dog was a Presbyterian. <laughs> we live in a wonderful time with all of the odds and the ends, with all of the problems and difficulties we face on a worldwide scale, we live in a wonderful time. I want to read a portion of scripture from John's Gospel, the 12th chapter. Then six days before the Passover came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. What a meeting that must have been. Here's Lazarus, who has died, and Jesus stepped up to the grave, the tomb, and said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus stepped forth, and the grave clothes were falling around his feet as he came out. There they made him a supper. And Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? About $132, about 300 days pay. It cost her for this ointment that she got over, that came from India, way up in the Himalayan mountains where these herbs grew tall and a wonderful, beautiful fragrance. And Mary had saved this ointment to anoint her body when she died. And here she is in the presence of Jesus when he has come for supper. And this man said, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bear what was put therein. Then said Jesus, let her alone. I guess the day of my bearing has she kept this for the poor always you have with you, but me you have not always. Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests consulted that they might put, that they might put Lazarus also to death because that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away from their leaders and believed on Jesus. What a setting. Mary represented light. Uh, Judas represented darkness, the other side of light. Lazarus represented new life. He has been raised from the dead. He came back from the dead. He knew what it was to cross that divide and go over to the other side. He died and Jesus called him back from the grave, from death. And here he sits in their midst and it's an unusual setting and Jesus is seated at the table with him. There are four people mentioned here and all four of them have a significant place. Mary has found the place of worship at the feet of Jesus. She's worshiping. And Martha has found a place of service because she's prepared a meal and is serving the meal. Now probably, probably Mary 
Mary was doing that which she did best. I mean, this was fitting for her to worship at the feet of Jesus. And Martha was doing that gift, that talent that she had of cooking. What a wonderful time it must have been in their house to have Martha cook a meal and prepare it. And here is the blessed son of God sitting at the table with him. What a day that must have been. And these are so thrilled to have him in the presence of their house in the, at their table to serve a meal and fellowship together as the blessed son of God sat with them. And out of this come many wonderful lessons. Wonderful things happened in a supper in this occasion. When Jesus came to supper, has he ever? Has he ever been at supper at your house? Has he ever filled that vacant place at your house? Has he ever sat at your table and you worshiped him? You thought about him. You were glad he was in your presence. You were happy he was your savior. And this is what Mary was experiencing when she sat at his feet and heard him expound the word, heard him speak, heard him talk. In this pornification world of America, shall we say, with all kind of ideologies and philosophical views that are displayed before us that is a disgrace, disgrace to humanity. We are living in a precarious time when God's people need to be in fellowship with Jesus and one with another. And you see it spills over into the church. This took place in a home. The first church was in a home. And now here is Jesus performing his last service and ministry in a home. It started back there. His ministry started in Canaan in, in, the, in a home where a wedding was taking place. He turned water to wine. And they were all amazed. And here Jesus is sitting at the table with Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. What a wonderful occasion it must have been. And Mary, this little lady had planned to do this maybe for some time. This ointment that she had prepared, saved for herself, for her burial when she died, they would pour this on her body. And so here she is now pouring this on the body of Jesus. What a fragrance filled the room of the presence and power of Jesus. Representative here today of the fragrance of the presence of Christ in our midst. We fail to do many things in life and wind up living in the slums of regret on the corner of put off and never do in the house of good intentions. We fail to say many things in life that would help others and we say things that hurt others and we don't stop to think about that. But we ought to stop and think about Will it honor Jesus if I say this? Will it honor me if I say this? Will it honor the other person if I say that? What about today? Where are you today in the midst of having Jesus home with you for supper? Having Jesus come today and dine with us in this wonderful place we call the house of God. How long has it been since you took somebody in your arms and hugged them and said, I love you? I thank God for you. Uh, we fail to express love. We hear it around our house quite often. People call and they'll always say before they hang up, we love you, we thank God for you. And that there's always the expression of love and I thank God for it. Uh, I never heard my father say, uh, I love you. I never heard my mom and my dad say, to each other, I love you. And to be in a place like that where people are supposed to love one another and you never hear it expressed. 
how tragic this must be. And, and it was tragic in that day and time. I had a revival in Albertville, Alabama at the Calvary Baptist Church one time. And uh, when the service was over, a man 41 years of age came and stood and took my hand in both of his hands and he said, preacher, he said, I buried my father last week who was 71 years of age. And said, I'm 41 years of age. And he said, I never heard my dad say, son, I love you. And he said, I never remember saying to my father, dad, I love you. Can you imagine living under the roof of somebody for 41 years and never hearing the word, I love you? You see, Jesus had changed Mary's life and they could have him in their home for supper and it would change their, their atmosphere. It would change the attitude in the home. And here is Mary that, is, that realizes Jesus means something special to her. And she has decided, and Mary, Martha is busy in the kitchen rattling the pots and pans, getting everything ready and putting this good food on the table and getting ready to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. And they gather and here is Lazarus. That represents new life. I'll never forget when I was saved and I came home from the tent meeting redeemed a child of God. And we sat down to the table. We bowed our heads and I held Olita's hands. And I said, I'm saved. I know Jesus. And we bowed our heads and prayed. And from that day till this day, day and night, I cannot remember a time when I have not prayed in Jesus' name. It means something. Ladies and gentlemen, why do we miss it? Why do we miss it? It's wonderful to have a wonderful time together as a family. There are three simple things I want to leave with you and I'm going to close and we'll go home. First of all, Mary did what she could. She could be with Jesus for supper. She could, she, she could be grateful to Jesus for what he had done for her, for what he meant to her. Uh, she could thank the Lord Jesus Christ. She could be thankful. She could worship Jesus. Is it hard for you to worship Jesus? Is it hard for you to come to the house of the Lord and worship? Is that a chore? Is that not a great thrill and a great wonder in your own heart when you come to worship? Mary could worship the Lord. Worship is the acknowledgement of the worship of God. It's worth something to worship God. It's worth something to put your best on and come to the house of the Lord, meet your fellow Christians and say, praise God from whom all blessings flow. It's worth something to do that. It's worth something to bow your head and pray in the name of Jesus and know that he's abundantly able to answer your prayer. I said to somebody down here last Sunday, they came when the pastor gave the invitation and people praying all over. And I said to a young man praying, I said, hundreds and thousands of people have been out here and prayed and they have not prayed a prayer that God could not answer if it's in his will. Pastor, that's amazing. That makes chills run over my body. To think that God is here. God can answer any prayer that you offer sitting out there in that pew. If you mean it in the will of God. And Mary could do that. She had Jesus in the home. How grateful she was. No wonder she took this expensive ointment and it breaks the box, the box and pours it on the head of the Lord Jesus. And I see it run down on his body and down and drip off. And then she got down and with her glory, with her hair, she wipes his feet. Ladies, don't underestimate the importance of your hair. Amen. Wait till you lose it like I've lost mine. <laughs> don't hesitate one minute to curl it. Don't hesitate one minute to pet it. Don't hesitate one minute to put the best lotion and best shampoo on your hair. It's your glory. And this woman got down and wiped his feet with her hair. And I see the blessed son of God sitting there composed 
and sitting in the presence of one whom he had just raised from the dead a short while before. And here's this gracious servant. Don't you be too hard on Martha for maybe being fretful at time with Mary for not coming and helping her. But hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. She's doing her talent. She's exercising her gift. She's doing that what she's talented to do. You blessed women, it's amazing what a miracle you can perform in the kitchen. <laughs> My soul in the morning, you can go in the kitchen and there's not much in there, but you can perform a miracle and you can prepare a wonderful meal and spread it before all of those hungry mouths that are going to come and sit around the table. How wonderful that is. It's wonderful to be able to do that. And God wants you to know that he loves you and he's abundantly able to supply your needs. Mary did what she could. Have you? Have you done what you could? You could accept Christ as your Savior. You could invite him to come into your heart and save you and he'd do it like that. And you'd become changed like that. You'd become a child of God like that. In a moment, you could do that today. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Oh, aren't you glad he said it that way? For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Mary did what she could, and she did it while she could. She didn't wait until it was too late. She didn't wait until Jesus was ready to go between heaven and earth and say, Lord, I'm wringing my hands. I, I was going to tell you one day that I loved you, and I was going to anoint you with this ornament symbolic of your approach in death. She didn't wait for that. But she did what she could and she did it while she could. Are you doing for Jesus what you could while you could? Some of you sit out there this morning and you have a beautiful voice and you could exercise it singing in the choir. You could do that if you would do that. You could do that. You can do that. And how wonderful. You could be teaching a Sunday school class down here, boys and girls. If you would, you could do that. You could be serving on some committee. You could be working. You could be bringing an offering to the house of the Lord. You could do that if you would do that. Mary did what she could and she did it while she could. She didn't wait until it was too late. Don't wait, my dear friend, until it's too late. I was walking down through the hall in the Veterans Hospital in Birmingham, Alabama. I passed by a door and there was a prematurely gray woman, brow wrinkled, standing in the door, twisting her hands like that of the little room. I walked on down the hallway a few steps and God arrested me. I came back and I stopped and looked in the room and there was a contraption, tubular steel tubes, two of them, about this far apart. And they were arranged so sitting on rollers and they rolled like this. And there was a stretcher across the middle of it and there was a body laying on that stretcher. I walked in and I said, ma'am, my name is J.M. Ethel. I'm from Ridgecrest Baptist Church and I, I saw this and I wanted to stop and meet you. She bowed her head, still wringing her hand. She stuck her hand out like that and I shook hands with her. And I said, is this one of your family members? And she said, he used to be my husband. He's lying there with the sheet over him. And the only movement of that body was his breathing. And I said, this is a member of your family? She said, that used to be my husband. Said he was a state trooper said he kissed me goodbye one morning at eight o'clock, crawled in the car and started down the highway and a drunken driver passed him. They estimated doing between 80 and 90 miles an hour and my husband started chasing him down the road and it came to a curve in the road and my husband couldn't make the curve and he slept into a big oak tree. And he's been like this for seven years. <laughs> she cried. I stood there and cried with her. She said he hadn't moved since then. And I said, ma'am, 
I'm, I must ask you this. Uh, I don't mean to be unkind. I said, was he a Christian? She, her chin quivered, tears puddled up in her eyes, rolled down her cheeks. She said, no. He didn't have time. He could have. He could have. But he didn't do it while he had time. Now he doesn't know who he is. For seven years, he couldn't tell you his name. For seven years, he hadn't batted his eyes. Putting off. Doing what he could do. How glorious it is to do what we can and do it while we can. Some of you could have a wonderful attitude toward your church. I mean, instead of criticizing the church, why don't you decide to follow the love of Jesus? It's author and finisher and just love your church. Love Christ. I love this place. I love to come to this place. I even love it since they redecorated it. (laughs) Amen. Amen. Man, I'm telling you what's the truth. Isn't this beautiful? I mean, they, they, they painted the bricks over here and they were they look good until they painted them and then it brought out all the flaws. <laughs> now, you know, I'm just kidding you with the truth. <laughs> and the beautiful red carpeting, man, this beautiful hardwood. I'd like to have that on my living room floor. Not here, not this but some like it. But how wonderful it is to come to the house. Well, I love Bethel Baptist Church, Pastor. And I, I, I'm glad God sent you this way. And I want to tell you before I die that I love you. And I'm not planning to die today. I'm not planning to die today. I'm planning to wait until later. We, we could do so many wonderful things if we just would... Uh, You can have a happy home, not a fuss, not nagging, not nagging, not fussing. A little fellow went to see his psychiatrist and the psychiatrist said, lie down over there. I want to talk with you. I want to ask you some questions. He said, where do you work? He said, here and there. He said, what do you do? He said, this and that. He said, well, when do you work? He said, now and then. He said, do you have trouble making up your money? He said, well, yes and no. Well, let me ask you this. Do you wake up grouchy every morning? Lord, no, I just let her sleep. <laughs> Have you ever been there? Huh? Have you been there? Have you been there? You know what I'm talking about, don't you? If we could just love one another and just, you're, you know, you, you used to court your wife and man, listen, she had ever hair. You know, she'd take those curling irons. You remember when they had curling irons? They had to stick them down in the lamp globe, you know, and get them hot and get some hair wound around that. You get to twist it and the smoke will begin to boil. I'm, that's where the frizzes originated. And they just burn, you know, you smell hair burning all over the house. And I had two, two sisters and they were getting ready for their date and they'd have their dresses pressed, you know, take an iron out from front of the fire and it press it, you know, and make sure they didn't scorch it. I mean, they were ready when that bird, I mean, when that squirt, I mean, when that boy stepped out and came up to knock on the door, my sisters would go to the door and say, come on in, come on in. Pa wants to talk with you. He'd come in nervously, you know, cause Pa wanted to talk with you. Now boys, I tell you, when you go see your girlfriend and Pa wants to talk with you, you better be ready for some answers because he's going to ask you some questions. Like Pastor Sims, he's got a cell phone (laughs) when you get in the car and start someplace. But everything had to be just right. I mean, she looked her best. You looked at her, you said, that's the most beautiful creature that's ever set foot on God's earth. You've been married a few years now. She comes out from the back with an old kimono wrapped around her. Her hair's done up in coat hangers and stove pipes. <laughs> she's got a house shoe on one foot and a horse shoe on the other. 
And you wonder, you wonder why. She wonders, why aren't you romantic? Ladies, let me tell you something that will surprise you. You look horrible. <laughs> Fix yourself up. You say, is it wrong to use rouge and lipstick and powder and paint? Lord, no, use all you can do. Enhance your looks. I mean, look great. And that husband comes home from work, he'll want to take you in his arms and flat lay one on you. And you'll be happy. You say, man, that's the greatest man that's ever set foot up on the face of the earth. And he'll say, you're the most Beautiful woman that's ever walked up on the face of the earth. <laughs> Praise God. Listen, we can have a good time in the home if we just do it instead of fuss. Just, just have a good time. Just determine that you're going to have a good time. Say, I'll just do it. I'll just do the right thing and say the right thing. And I'll do it. I'll, you could show appreciation for each other in the home. You could show appreciation for each other in the church. Have you gone to your Sunday school teacher lately and say, thank you for teaching us? Have you gone down there where that teacher meets with that, that little boy, that little girl, that son or daughter, and you never see them because they're behind closed doors. And that little boy or girl's kicking around, making a noise and so forth, and you're trying to wonder what's taking place, and that teacher's pulling her hair out, <laughs> trying to keep them quiet. But they got to learn. They got to be taught. So don't try to make an adult out of them. Just work with them as children. See, they're children. They're little. They're not smart like you. They got to learn to be smart like you. And so go tell them. Have you told the choir members lately that you love them? You appreciate what they do and they sing? Have you told our music director lately that you appreciate him? I told him yesterday, I appreciate it. He, was, he wanted me to go visit with him. He was scared to go by himself. <laughs> so he wanted me to go with him. I went with him and then I was scared to go. <laughs> <laughs> but we had a great time visiting. And just drop in and say hello. We didn't have a bone to pick with anybody. Pastor, we weren't putting out fires. We were just trying to start some. <laughs> for you to put out. <laughs> I just do what the pastor says do. I'm his associate. If I do the wrong thing, I'll say, the pastor told me to do it. <laughs> but we have a great joy in serving the Lord together. And it can be that way in your home. Serve God together in your home. Come on, get in that church. Get in the will of God. Serve the Lord. Be a part of the church. Don't procrastinate and put it off any longer. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to come and do what God wants you to do. How wonderful it is to be saved and to know Jesus as your Savior. Now, I've been pastoring a church for many years and I, I know a little something about people's psychology. And I can tell when somebody's got a cockaburr under their collar. You ever seen a mule pulling and get a cockaburr under their collar and they do like that, you know, they can't stand that stick it. I've seen people in church that came down with spiritual cockaburrs. They get, you know, something wrong and they don't want to speak to you. And they meet you and they look straight ahead like this, just straight ahead. They don't want to look in front, just straight ahead, just looking straight ahead, you know. Wonder how in the world did they stand it? They run into something. Well, what it is, they don't want to look at you. I can understand why they wouldn't want to look at me because I'm not much to look at, but you ought to see them. <laughs> love one another. This is a house of love and respect for each other. We love each other. <laughs> We do, we love each other. We just have a good time in the Lord. A lady called me here a while back and she really raked me over the coals. I want you to know she was telling me off. I said, okay. I just sat there and listened. 
Mildred and Gilda Martin. You know Gilda Martin, don't you? Well, you hang around a little while, you'll know her. She, she'll tell you, where's Gilda? Where's Steve? Sitting on the back pew? Lord. But anyway, they were listening. Yeah, I see you now. Yeah, I wanted her to come and sing a solo. She sat so far back there, she was afraid I was going to go. Gilda, I wouldn't do that to you. Well, you know I love you, Gilda, like my daughter. I wouldn't do that to you. You wait and see. <laughs> but I, uh, I was talking. She was just reading me the right act. And I said, Lord, help me here. I'm in trouble. And I said everything I knew to say, Pastor Sims. And I said, well, I'm so sorry. I, I just hate it. I, I hate it that, you know, that we haven't been able to do more for you. But I said, I don't, I don't know what to do. She said, well, Saturday was my birthday and nobody from the church called me and wished me happy birthday. I said, that's all right. I said, I'll sing happy birthday to you. <laughs> so I just started saying, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. You didn't know I could sing like that, did you? <laughs> I didn't either until I sung to her. And I just love her. I love the lady. I praise God for her. You know, I wasn't mad at her brother's pastor. I just loved her. Praise God for her. Happy birthday. How many of you have I sung happy birthday to? <laughs> yeah, some of you raised your hand. Drop an extra few dollars in the collection plate next Sunday. <laughs> but Mary did what she could. She did it in the presence of all of those gathered in that little house around that table where the Lord Jesus sat. She wasn't ashamed to do this for Jesus. She wanted to show him how much she loved him. She did it for Jesus. Do you love people? Do you love others? Do you love others? And it's difficult to love some people. It's difficult for you to love me at times. I, I don't always act like I should, and I, I'm, I'm sorry, but uh, we don't always act like we should, but we love one another. We respect one another. Praise the Lord for one another. And I love people. I love people. I love to see people say, brother and sister Davis are here this morning and we were visiting in their home the other night and uh, Mildred and I, I was talking with them and I asked him if he had been saved. He said, no. No, he said, I, I've never been saved. Ms. Ms. Davis, you're here this morning. Carol. Uh, isn't it wonderful when we can sit down with somebody and just talk with them about Jesus and see them just leap into the kingdom of God. Listen, that's one of the greatest joys in the world. What are you doing hanging around out there with somebody that don't win anybody to Jesus and never do? And all you have to do is just win them to know Christ as Savior. And they get saved. I went to Birmingham one cold winter evening, Christmas Eve winter uh, evening and parked in the parking lot. Uh, down on First Avenue next to James A. Head Office Supply. And I was a little fellow with a short sleeve sport coat on, came out and took my keys from part of my car. And uh, I could feel his hand tremble like I was cold, blue cold. He took his, had a little short sleeve and he took it and wiped his nose. <laughs> Very I had on a nice coat, overcoat, and I stepped out and walked down First Avenue down to 19th Street and stepped off in the curb and it had letters down there, don't be a gutter strutter. And I was standing down in the gutter. And then I thought of that little man that I left up there and I said, I didn't ask him if he was saved. I said, Lord, if you let me get down here to everybody's department store and pick up this item, when I get back up there, I'll talk with him about Jesus. 
And I hurried. <laughs> I went back to the parking lot. When he handed me the keys, I just took his hand like that. I said, son, I didn't say this to you a while ago, but I said, let me ask you, have you ever been saved? <laughs> that little boy's eyes widened, his mouth fell open. And he said, no, sir. And I said, uh, you need to be saved, don't you? He said, I sure do. And I said, well, listen, Jesus loves you and Jesus can save you. And so I went over the Roman road in the plan of salvation. It took about two minutes. That little boy standing, I could feel it holding his hand. I could feel his body shake. It was cold. And I said, would you trust Christ as your Savior? Would you invite him to come into your heart and save you? And he said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And tears puddled up in his eyes and rolled down his cheeks. And I helped him pray a simple prayer of trusting Christ as a Savior and inviting Jesus to come into his heart and save him. And here he is standing there in that parking lot about 15, 16 years of age. And I said, now, son, tomorrow's Sunday. Would you come to church tomorrow and be in church? He said, I'll go with my friend over to uh, Central Baptist Church in Tarrant City. Brother Freeman is the pastor over there. I said, that's fine. Wonderful. You go over there for church. So I had a word of prayer and thanked the Lord for it, got my automobile and drove away. Monday morning, I was sitting in my office and my secretary called, said, Pastor, Brother Freeman over at Tarrant City wants to talk with you. And I picked up the phone. He said, Shelly, he said, there was a young man came down the aisle Sunday morning. He had on a little short sleeve shirt, had on tennis shoes, and the strings were open. They were flopping back and forth. Said he had combed his hair, washed his face just right around the face like that and pushed his hair back. Said he stood there and held my hand. And he said, sir, he said, yesterday a tall preacher came by and led me to Jesus and said, would you let me join this church, and would you baptize me? And Brother Freeman said, I told him, yes, sir. We'd be glad to do that. We'd be honored to baptize you. And he said, there, who was this man that led you to Jesus? He said, I don't know who he was. But he parked his car, went down the street a little ways, and he came back, and when he held my hand, he wouldn't pay me until he talked with me about Jesus. And he said, he helped me trust Christ as my Savior. And Brother Freeman said, I baptized him last night and said, when I was talking with him, said, I know who that tall preacher was. So that was Pastor Ezell. He said, that's who it was. <laughs> That was a great trip, Pastor. That made my Christmas. That made my Christmas, and it made his. See, if we just do what we can do and what we should do, it's amazing what God can do with you. God can use you. Get in the harness. Get in the work. Serve the Lord Jesus. Serve him a supper. Serve him a dinner. Come to the house of the Lord and serve him in that place of responsibility and do it in great spirit. Don't come with a chip on your shoulder. We don't need you if you've got a chip on your shoulder. We need you to get the Lord, take that chip off your shoulder and get into the work of the Lord and do it with a great spirit and serve God with a great spirit. God loves you. God wants to use you in a great way. And think of how God used little Mary and Martha in her place. And there set a living testimony of new life in Christ Jesus. All when Jesus came for supper. It can happen. Some of you sitting here today, the thing you need to do is stand and come down here and commit your life to Jesus and say, Lord, I'm sorry, I haven't served you like I should. You need to come this morning, move your letters. Some of your letters are podunk holler and, and you come here, you found a place to worship. You found a place where you can enjoy the blessings of the Lord and you need to come today and say, Pastor, I want to move my letter and be a part of this church. You could do that today. You can do that this morning. You got time to do that now. You may not have time to do that next Sunday. 
You may not live till next Sunday. You could do that today. And you could do it in the presence of all of these. Unashamed of Jesus said, if you're ashamed to confess me before men, I'll be ashamed to confess you before the heavenly father. Come this morning, unashamedly say, I'll do it for the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll do it for my sake because I need the will of God in my life. I need Christ in my heart. Come on this morning. Do it this morning. Do it today. Oh, today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Today is the day of salvation, not tomorrow, today. Father, thank you for the word of God. Thank you for the simplicity and the profoundness of this blessed truth this morning. Thank you for these in that humble abode, Lord, that entertain the creator of the world who flung the stars in place, Lord, who created everything that we see about us today. He did it. He set it into being. And there he sits at the table with Martha and Mary and Lazarus. What a foursome. This can happen in this home with this people. This man, woman needs to be saved. This boy, girl needs to be saved. This couple needs to come move their letter. This couple needs to come today and step out and say, I want God's will done in my life above everything else. Would you do that? God grant that this is the moment of decision for every person in this building. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand? Our pastor will be down here. We'll be here. Our youth pastor will be here. You come. Others will be here to help you. Just don't hurry. Don't hurry now. Let God have time to work in your heart in these moments of invitation. Just step out and come on right now while we sing. You come.